Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Liquid Brain. So today I want to talk about gene set enrichment analysis and the basic concept of how is it designed and why is it designed like that. So there'll be two parts to this video where the first part where I try to talk through gene set enrichment analysis and the second part will be an Excel sheet which I'm going to walk you through how each part of the GSEA is designed and how do you manipulate the parameters so you can see the effect of it. So if you're here looking for the R code, this is not a video. I'm going to link that video right here. Uh, so you can actually go and watch that on how to run this analysis in R, specifically using the cluster profiler uh, package. Okay, so the concept of GSEA actually come from the way of how we deal with DEG before. So before that, we actually use something called an over-representation analysis. And an example would be if you have 50 DEG, uh, from resulting from analysis and you compare the composition of that 50 DEG to the overall gene list. So I put in an example, we have 50 DEGs here and you have 20,000 genes in the overall analysis. And if you compare that within that 50 genes, 50% 50 of that is involved in the replication pathway, but in the overall only 10% of it is involved in the replication pathway. So this constitute an enrichment factor of five, which means that the two population uh, is differ significantly in their replication pathway, whether upregulated or downregulated. You can set your own parameters and actually try to investigate the effect based on that. Well, the problem is how do we define and how do we constitute what is the DJ and what is not. So the traditional cutoff that we use is using a full change of plus two or minus two. So whether overexpressed of two or underexpressed of two. And with a p-value lower than 0.05, it can be a p-value, p-adjust, or FDR. It depends on uh, how sensitive you want yours to be. But they always come to the same problem of what if you have a full change of 1.98 and a p-value of 0 0.4995? Uh, it's still gonna it's still gonna contribute to the overall difference between the two phenotypes, but usually we don't include them in the analysis. And this is actually worse when you have a little number of DG. For example, 10 or 20 of it. So every single addition of those genes is going to significantly change the composition, which means that your ORA over representation analysis uh, no longer makes any sense. And you really need to relook into how you do experiment or, you know, how do you redesign the whole thing. So uh, in around 2003 or 2005, it, 2003 is the original and 10 is being uh, written. And the 2005 is where the GSEA paper published in. PNAS, proceeding in the National Academy of Science. So what they try to do is that we no longer has a fixed number or cut off for the, for the DG analysis. And what we're trying to do is to find accumulated effect of expression in the two phenotype with a kind of ranking system, which I'm going to walk you through later on how to do that. So the example of some GSEA analysis you have seen before, it will be something like that where what we are trying to see is to try to see a mountain and uh, the peak of the mountain is where you want to take that as your enrichment score. So the higher the mountain, the more significant is the enrichment. And in this case, if you look at the proteosome and oxidative phosphorylation, they have about 0 0.6. So these two pathway is what is being enriched. And these are the full pathway you want to look into after you have done your analysis for GSEA. Okay, so I'm going to base the algorithm later in these two papers, which is the pathway guide and the original uh, PNAS paper from right here. So what I, what I try to do here is actually what I, I try to simplify the mathematics in a way that where you can try to understand and see things on a lower scale. So it's not going to be as complicated as the original paper, but it should allow you to understand the concept. So please don't apply this algorithm in your analysis. Uh, they're not technically valid and structured and solid in such a way. Okay, so the four main steps before actually we go into the Excel is step one is to try to rank the genes at, based on the expression and p-value. And we try to calculate an enrichment score using what we call a random walk, okay, which is the green line that you see just now. So the step two will be estimation of the significant level of the enrichment score that were calculated in step one. And step three is to adjust for multiple hypothesis testing. I'm going to tell you what is that later. And the last one is actually the permutation for significant comparison to ensure that the p-value that you get, ensure the enrichment score that you get 
it's going to be significant because of the circumstances that it is in rather than you know just some random situation where it happens so for now um you can actually find the link to the excel in the video description down below i'll say go ahead and go and download it and pause the video and then we'll come back in a second okay welcome back so here again i included six examples of a gsea plot on six different kind of pathway so you can see that all of them has a green line that actually rises sharply in front and they actually faded off slowly in the back so i'm going to show you why is it later on in step one okay so in step one as you can see that i included from a to column a to g the gene expression of two different phenotype control and treatment and from the two from the gene expression here i can actually calculate the log to fold change between the two sample as well as the p-value so i'm going to use a simple t-test because just an example of on trying to make you understand the thing so once we get the log to fold change and p-value it is where we start to calculate the rank matrix and how we rank them so the concept of ranking is that we want to have the highest fold change on one side so the upregulated gene on the left and now regulate the gene on the right and we also want to consider beside just the fold change also the p-value so in this case what they're using here is actually a negative log 10 of the p-value times the log to fold change so what this essentially does is that you create a rank matrix which the most upregulated genes will be on top with the most upregulated gene with the lowest p-value will be on top and the most downregulated gene with the lowest p-value will be on the bottom so as you can see that these are ranked nicely from 1 to 19 based on the two of that and upregulated gene low p-value on top uh, downregulated gene low p-value on the bottom so once we're done that i'm gonna give just name them gene 1 to gene 19 and i'm, I'm gonna assign them to three different pathways i think this should be a b okay so let's let's run our simulation now on on term a okay so how we're going to calculate the enrichment score using the random walk is that we go through gene one gene two gene three one by one and every time we encounter an a because we are targeting pathway a we encounter an a we're gonna plus one to our running sum okay a running sum yes correct so every time we did not encounter a a for example a b i'm gonna deduct uh, some portion of it in this case 0 0.5 okay so as you can see that the running sum will go from 0 because it's a a a is going to plus 3 and this is a b i'm going to minus 0 0.5 and plus back a 1 minus 0 0.5 plus back a 1 and so on and so forth until i have finished the whole gene list and once i plot this running sum this is essentially the green line that we see just now as you can see that it rises to the top here and it slowly faded off to the back so we can see that there is a significant enrichment of this pathway uh, in this uh, gene in this ranking of the gene list okay just to sh show an example of what isn't you can see that this is enrichment based on b so again trying to run a running sum it is going to be very very flat as compared to what they have but we can actually see a little bit of enrichment in the back so it might be actually involved in only the down regulated gene while a is an up regulated gene so uh, just to give you another example of if there's no enrichment among all the score so for example i'm just going to randomly assign a b c to all of them uh, your enrichment plot is going to look like this right just a flat line straight forward and there's no enrichment of any kind of value or any kind of pattern we can see so in this case this is our now hypothesis there's no enrichment okay so you can see that the main difference between the two is how does the shape differ so what we want is a normal distributed curve rather than a flat line so this is where we go to our second simulation based on the uh chromo something similar so I, i'm gonna put the thing i'm gonna put the the test in the down below so what does chaos uh, analysis actually does is that does the population actually follow a normal distribution so if you follow a normal distribution it will give you a p-value higher than 0 0.5 if it's not then of course you go if you give you a, a p-value that's lower than 0 0.05 so you can reject the hypothesis 
And again, you can actually change the cutoff depends on the sensitivity required for your experiment. So uh, this is actually based originally on cumulative frequency, which is why I plot it out right here. But what we want to actually look at is the second plot here. So you imagine there's three different pathways that we run just now, A, B, and C. And the three different pathways on their enrichment plot actually looks like this. So A has a very sharp rise and then it goes back down. B uh, almost has nothing. Sorry, uh, sorry. A has a very flat line. So A is in this case the it's a it's a blue line, and B in this case is the orange line, and C in this case the gray line. So this is not related to what we did in the in the tab before. They're independent. Okay. So as we can see, the orange one obviously is gonna be uh, normal distributor in this case. Uh, that is going to be an enrichment, the other two does not. So if you actually run this uh, list of numbers into a KS calculator, which I'm going to include right here, the komogorov simrov test calculator, so you can see that in A, we can see there's a significant difference. Let me just go and adjust this a little bit for you. Okay, so as you can see that in, in A, which is the flat line, there's a significantly different from normal distribution, which indicate that it is not a normal distribution. So we're going to reject A. So same happens with C, where the p-value is higher than 0. Point, sorry, the p-value is lower than 0 0.05. So we're going to reject this one because they are also not a normally dis normal distribution. But in, in, in distribution B, we can find that there's a non-significant difference from the normal distribution. So we can accept the fact that it is a normal distribution and we're going to consider this enrichment score as significant and useful. So we're going to, we're going to include this in our enrichment term and we're going to use the maximum enrichment score as the adrenaline value for the downstream analysis. So that's basically step two for the care simulation. So the third one, of course, is the multiple testing based on the Benjamin Hochberg procedure. So again, I'm not going to go deep into how is it and why it is, but this is basically the concept. So imagine we have all the enrichment score calculated for every single of the goal term, right? So you have goal term 41 until all of them, there's hundreds of them. So you have all the p-value done. So in traditional sense, if you're just going to use a 0.05 cutoff, uh, you will get until from here to, oops, 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 what did I done? So from here to here, so you get 19 significant pathway that you're going to consider. Okay, so however, we need to actually add a multiple testing because you're testing too many of things and it's going to be a lot of false positive. So how does pH correction works is we're going to assume a 20% of false discovery rate. So again, this is based on your sensitivity and how you run your experiment, but usually we take it 20% and we're going to do a divide the total thing by the number of sample times the FDR rate. Sorry, uh, we're going to do a ranking divide by the number of sample times the FDR rate. So in this case, 1 divide by 100 times 0 0.2. So which is why the first pH correction factor is 0 0.02. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing for 100 of them. For example, let's look at number 20, uh, row 25 over here, where it says 12 divide by 100 times 0 0.02, which is why our pH correction factor, pH correction factor is 0 0.02400. So what happens later is that we have to compare our pH correction to our p-value. So what we are trying to find is that we need to have, first of all, the p-value has to be lower than 0 0.05 and it needs to be lower than the p-value that we calculated, sorry, normal than the correction factor that we calculated. So we look at the first one, the correction factor is 0 0.002, this one is 0 0.01, so we're going to consider it as true and we're going to accept it as significant. And the second one is 0 0.004 and 0 0.003, so we're again going to accept this one as significant. But the third one, of course, it does not actually crosses the threshold, where it has been, it's, a, it's already larger than the pH correction factor. So we're going to consider them as false and we're going to take everything on the second term onwards. So in this case, even though you might have 19 goal term that are significant based on the original um, p-value calculation, but after the correction factor, you have shrink 90 of them into two, which is what we want so we can reduce our false positive that we have. So this is a standard Benjamin Hotsburg procedure. 
uh, for most of the ranking and p-value calculation. But Chess is A has a little bit more um, toler not tolerance in it, a little bit more calculation in the way that how they want to test that is significant. And this is what we call a permutation test. Okay, so for example, again, I'm going to use a generalized statement, a generalized test example here on female uh, versus male and their income level and I want to see if this two different phenotype or these two different gender is going to have a significant difference in their income. So I have two populations, sample 1 to 9 is male and sample 10 to 18 is going to be female and this is going to be their income level. Okay, so in general sense, the p-value actually is different, it's lower than 0 0.05 and there's a strong uh, significance between to make sure there's a strong uh, evidence that these two are different from each other. But just to ensure that happen, what they're going to do is run permutation on their observed phenotype. In this case, I'm going to reassign the whole gender to all the different sample on a random basis and calculate the p-value. So if I do that on the first permutation, I found that the p-value is really, really big. So 0 0.9856. So I'm going to do the same procedure again randomizing the gender between all my sample and calculate the p-value again. So in this case, it's going to be 0 0.47168. So this is going to happen over and over and over and over again, maybe for 100 or 1000 times with all the different uh, permutation and combination. And then what happens is that we're going to plot all the p-value out just to make sure that our p-value is actually Oh, I didn't include the thing. So I'm going to include uh, the graph right here. So I'm going to make sure that the p-value actually is the top, maybe the 5% or 10% uh, lowest among all the permutation that I have. So if, it below, if it's below a certain threshold, I can accept that this experiment is indeed significant because not only because the p-value is low, but also because when compared to all of the other permutation that I have done, it is significant that uh, the p-value is lower than most of the per per permutation that I've simulated in my, in my analysis. So in this case, it can be permutating their goal term, their pathway enrichment, or the kind of expression that it, it can be many type of permutation that they run to ensure their significance and to make sure to reduce the false positive that could be from the analysis that we have. So that's basically the whole concept of GSEA. Again, I hope that you don't just listen, but actually download this file and try to change the different value and try to understand how it works. And that will be the best way for you to understand how, how it is. Uh, for now, I want to say that's all I have to say about GSEA. Leave any question down below and I do not have a complete truth about the whole situation. And if I say anything wrong about analysis, please leave a comment down below and I'll try to actually pin it and make sure that people in the future understand what I'm going to say. That's all I have to say. I will say thank you for watching and we will see you in the next one. Bye.